Um, first question is why coding? I always say it's just a tool to show what you know. So why not use something that's super engaging to kids? It's way more fun than a piece of paper and a pencil. So uh, I also say my friend Scott says it's like bit strips on steroids. So why not give it to them? Why not let them show what they know through this amazing tool? And we're going to skip right into it. We're going to talk about math and language today from a grade 1, 3, and 6 perspective. And Scott's going to start off in grade 1. Okay, so uh, I'm going to show you a math example. But here in grade 1, we have location and movement. So having students start and, and doing this generally in real life, so which we would call unplugged coding. Uh, where they're doing all the computational thinking, but they're just doing it with their own bodies. So having them walk through the process of getting around the chair. So they might just say, well, you just walk forward and you go around the chair. And it's like, well, explain each step though. So letting them think carefully about each step, it, it ties into engineering later in life where you have to think about each step in a process to make something work properly and get them thinking about how that works. Um, here, it's positional language. So this is right out of the curriculum in grade one. And so using this different language, they, they talk their way through something. So once they've done it unplugged, you can't see the grid, but this is Scratch Junior, which is on our, all of our iPads. And there's a grid system that you can call up. And then it also has the Y and the X axis with the numbers. And they're all positive numbers, so it's great for the kids to start thinking about where it is on that grid. And placing three sprites, we want the cat to make it over to the frog. So they're using the language you're supposed to use, but they can first literally drag it with their finger and, walk, and have someone talk them through it. But then they can go down to the code blocks and they can start to apply the code blocks, putting in each step in the process. In grade three, uh, this was compare and order various shapes. Uh, so we were basically building area. And what I started with was just two squares. And I threw two squares up on the board and just said, how are these squares related? we just done 2D shapes. So the first thing they said was they're both congruent, they're both plain, they both, like, they all the stuff about 2D shapes. And I said, well, how are they related though if that little square was going into the big square? What would that mean? So trying to get them to think about area. Uh, we did the, a little bit of that with grid paper, but what I really wanted to think about was the actual map. There's a lot of, there's division happening, there's, there mul there's multiples with the same number. So what I did was, I said, if this square here is 400 pixels wide, how many of these small squares would go inside? And so they have to start thinking about what numbers would fit into the bigger number. And then how do I make that work? So there's a lot of math happening. They're basically doing division, and they're creating these smaller squares. And we literally started with perimeter, where they were just trying to get, figure out how many squares would go across. And if that was a unit of measure, then there'd be five squares across. And what I said was, if you finish early, as a challenge, try to figure out how you would create the area. So for the students who finished the task early and already understood it, I, I want to see if they could figure out how to do area and code it. So it's not perfect code. Like, I had to go back to try and tighten up the code. Okay, how many little squares fit in the big square? 25. Good job. Because he literally had it create all the squares, he understood how all the numbers went together. So not only numbers across, but the numbers going up. So using the code from that later, they were able to basically multiply because they took the number and the repeat, the different uh, variables. So the repeat and then how many times you draw. So taking those two numbers, eight and six, would make, so each time they did that, they were multiplying. And so they, they started to draw out that relationship with multiplication, area of multiplication, how they fit together. You can do just about anything with it, you just have to decide what it is you're focusing on, but there's a lot of possibilities. Uh, so my example is 356. Uh, I simply posed the question, uh, I want to talk about measurement today. And I want to talk about specifically perimeter, area, surface area, and volume. And I said, I want to talk about squares and triangles as well, or triangle-based prisms or rectangle-based prisms. And before we start, we had a little talk about the unit itself. I said, well, the unit of Scratch is pixels. And you guys can use it as a unit. You can use pixels or pixel squared or pixels cubed. Uh, I said, or if you look at it and drew a little line within it, we said, well, it's roughly 50 pixels to one centimeter. So if you want to use centimeters, you can use it that way as well. And most children started with a simple example of a perimeter. 
So they drew a square or a triangle and they said, well, my square is so big by so big. I said, great. Well, take that information. What would the area of that be? And they went from there. And I said, great. Now that you know that, what about three-dimensional shapes? Let's start there. And they started off with different conversations. They said, well, Mr. Sully, what's the right turn? Well, that's 90 degrees. Another math concept. Um, well, what about three-dimensional shapes? Well, it's coordinates. You have to know the x, y axis. If you start here and draw to this point, that's how you get the lines for three-dimensional shapes. Uh, and then you got into conversations of variables. So it got really neat really quick. And I have a few examples here that I'm going to plug through. Stop. Yeah, we'll do that. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. Um, this is Rashad. Rashad started off with a printer. And he liked elephants. And even in the second one, he had elephants in there, too. And he pressed these arrow buttons. Uh, it quickly draws a, a rectangle, and it asks you the question, if this is three centimeters, what is a printer? Can anybody tell me what the answer is for a prize? Dollar Ranchers. Anybody, is it late Friday afternoon? Yes. 12 centimeters, perfect. Dollar Ranchers. Can you pass that back? Thanks. And then, <laughs> you celebrate that, you, you won that. So now that you know the printer, what's the area of a three by three square? Anybody else for a prize? Nine. Nine what? Nine what? Oh, was it centimeters? Centimeters squared. Square. Perfect. Well, if you don't put centimeters squared in it, you're actually wrong. So yeah. should I show wrong? Yeah. You bet. There's crickets in place. <laughs> <laughs> like a then, uh, so if we go to Emma's example, she taught me something, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, M took the surface area, and she drew it three-dimensionally. It goes pretty quick. Start. Yeah. And, and then the code. So far, the code has been linear too. So it's you started here and you're talking about you're doing what you need to do through your code. The next example is, is pretty powerful. So M basically said to calculate surface area, it's the first rectangle, the second rectangle, um, you times that by two, the first one, and then the second one you times by four. And I said, well, M, is that right? What if that's a what if that's a rectangle that's longer, not a square? What if that square is not a rectangle? Um, and, and she said, well, yeah, it still works that way. And I said, well, no, actually it doesn't. Um, all of a sudden you have three pairs of equal sides if this becomes a rectangle. So we had that neat conversation about how her code actually calculated it wrong, and she had to fix her code to accommodate for different shapes than just perfect shapes. And the last one is Ahmed. Ahmed blew me away. Um, Ahmed used coding from an adult stance, uh, where he's calling the teams. And it's like if you were to tie your shoes in the morning, and then later on in the afternoon you trip on the chair, and you have to tie your shoe again. And then later on the bully gets you and pulls your, your lace undone, and you have to tie your shoe again. Most people would just code that like this. Well, he created these routines that he would call. And he would call them and say, tie my shoe, it would run that code tie my shoe, you would run that code. And so you would do that through um, receiving and broadcasting. So you only had to write that once, which is a great way of coding. And so if you want to play his real quick, yeah. let me get on to your next one. He started off um, in centimeters. He has a friend that's going to help him. He told the uh, kids what units they should use as well. Uh, that's Devin. Welcome, Devin. And this is all through coding. He has coded all of this. And then uh, he draws a three-dimensional shape. And then he said, what would the perimeter of the bottom of this uh, square base prism be? Anybody know for a prize? Seven hundred. I heard it's 700. 700 what? Seven hundred. Seven hundred. So he goes on. The next step, I said, fantastic. Um, you got that. Well, what's the volume of the shape? What's the surface area of the shape? And we kept on pushing this way. And he actually got all of this through this one program. But because of time, I'm going to kick out and we're going to go on to the next slide. Yeah. So, anyone here at grade one levels? So, just coming back to curriculum. So, make simple revisions to improve their content, clarity, and interest of their written work using a few simple strategies, and then identify elements that are ready and needs improvement. Uh, organization big, uh, and using feedback from teacher and peers. So, as they're writing that 
unplug coding, that whole process of walking through it and figuring things out, as they write it down and then they act it out or they have a partner and they do it together, they're revising their work and they're really revising it, not because you said it's not right yet, you have to go back and fix it, and they go, oh. They, they're genuinely interested in getting it right. So because it's from their peers, they seem to take it more seriously and they actually go back and they work at it. And I can make that mouse work. Um, so here's some examples. This is a grade one teacher in our board, and she's tribes, so the triplets, and they were talking about those anyways, and then they got these little fuzzy creatures and grid paper, and they started having the kids doing this. They'd already done it with their bodies, and then having that character do it. So you're doing it from a top-down perspective, and then you move from that over here to, this is Codable, which is a uh, coding app, kindergarten, grade one, uh, lots of language that you can apply to it, but it has no language in it itself. It's just arrows, and you tell it which way to go. It does interest introduce some good coding, like if, then, variables, things like that. But it starts very simple. And so once they've done it top down, then they're carrying it over to a side-scrolling program. So there's a lot of thinking that happens, and the kids are really thinking about those different instructions. Grade three example, uh, again, writing, oops, sorry. Uh, writing example. So topic, purpose, and audience for your writing. So if you're writing comics for your principal, uh, they might be different than they are if you're writing for your peers or if you're writing for your parents. So they were thinking about how to write comic strips that would be funny. Uh, these strips are gone, but if you take screenshots and scratch, you can take a screenshot, kind of take out the extra stuff, and then they just quickly build a website. Oops. If you quickly build a website and just throw your screenshots on, you've got a comic that you can share with anyone. Your grandma that lives in another country, share the link with her and you've got your comic. Now, these are unedited, and they're first tried this, so don't mind, but mmm, I am not yummy. I am poisonous. <laughs> and of course, yummy. Eat some. Oh no! And there's a surfboard, convenient place to throw up the taco. Oh my! Super taco! And here's the interactive fun part where. Taco eats. <laughs> okay, um, so a lot of engagement there. Suddenly the students are reluctant writers or not reluctant writers because they're so excited to do something cool like that. They just, they, the writing is, is, is really fun and exciting and engaging. And I'll just show you this one. Halloween, tough time to keep kids motivated and stuff. So we did these on Halloween day. And again, intended audience. So here's the joke. What do you call a fat pumpkin? Anyone? A plumpkin. Uh, now he gives instructions too on how to play this, but when you start this, it looks pretty cool, but if I hit allow, you get to be in the comic with the characters. <laughs> so, pretty engaging running activity. Uh, I agree, five, six. I was going to say, too, um, if you're making video games with this, you can use that interactively. You can actually move your characters with your hands as well, and you can become like, a joystick on your own. Yeah. So you think, but, uh, three, five, six. We worked on narratives, uh, and you need an animal. Uh, I was truly looking for voice. I was looking for dialogue, figure of language. I was looking for problems, a solution, and I looked for a moral in all the stories as well. Um, I truly recommend if you're going to start with this, start your kids off in CS first. Uh, it is a program that shows off videos, shows you how to do everything. It's a great way, and, and the first thing truly is how to do storytelling in Scratch. So it's a great way of teaching them how to do that. Um, I then uh, let them go, and I said, start doing your story in Scratch. And I, I was going to show Star Scratch off, but it's, it's super long. It's made by this kid. It's 498 modules. Uh, it would take about five minutes to those. We're going to skip that. If you want to see it, please go back on the slide later and look at it later. But Anna had uh, her story done first, so I said to her, I would show up her story. Yeah. So M's moral truly was to uh, look after the things that you're given. Um, in her story, she's asking her mom for a, a horse, and she said, what if you die? Who's going to get to the horse? What if I don't die, mom? That's too bad. I say your mom talks to you. Uh, and so initially she meant the next day, the characters were saying the next day, I said, well, let's use a background for that for the next day. 
um, initially mom was the same size as her. I said, does that make sense? Your mom the same size as you, or is she bigger than you? We also talk about perspective, like what if the characters are close, what if the characters are far away. Um, and then eventually in a story, uh, Em doesn't feed her horse, and then mom takes away the horse, gives it to her sister, of all things. Uh, and then Em learns a lesson, does her chores, and then uh, Em gets the horse back again, so it's a happy ending. I uh, asked her why is the horse in the kitchen, so that's some of the coding that she has to do to kind of figure that out, the small bugs within coding, uh, but she did fantastic, I was quite proud of her. And that's really it. So, uh, we focus here just on math and language and just specific examples, but you can apply this to science, you can apply this to social studies, there's just so many ways you can draw this in. And if you're giving students a choice in how they share, it doesn't have to be everybody doing coding. There'll be three or four students in your class that this really, really works for them. It's, it's kind of how they think, it's in their wheelhouse. So it might be just a way that they naturally gravitate towards and they, they want to share their learning that way. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to just expand how they do things if they're interested in it, but you don't have to have everybody in the class doing it all the time. Um, these are, Greg and I are doing a workshop at PD Place, November 29th. It's an introduction to coding. So everything from down to kindergarten up to grade six, just kind of an introduction to how different apps work. Uh, we'll get you started. I'd like to plug in there too that it's not that advanced. If you're looking, if you're already confident with Scratch, I would recommend coming as truly an introduction. We are going to work on a more advanced coding course too, and maybe get into the JavaScript as well. Yeah. Uh, Scratch tutorials are here. If you click on that link, it brings you right into the Create page. You don't need to sign up your class for like they were originally made for coding clubs, so that an adult working with a coding club at a school could just get them started. You don't have to have them sign up and go through the whole process. You can literally take them right to that Create page and do things there. Um, CS First is the tutorials. Wait, wait. Oh, scratch tutorials. This one's for younger kids, so if you have grade one, two, or three, and the CS First is about grade three, four, and up. So if you have younger kids, this website here has a whole bunch of, and there's more being added all the time, um, little projects. And they start with a video tutorial, so you don't have to know anything going in. The video tutorial will walk you through the process. The person doing the video even speaks slowly. Hello, this video is intended for teachers and students who are trying to get started with Scratch in the primary grades. Okay, I won't play anymore, but you can watch it with your class, you can follow along, and it, I did this last year with a couple of grade one classes, and they, they were fine with it. Once they can read what the blocks are, and there's little projects too, so you can watch the video, click here, and you get a pre-built project with some, some scripts already in it. So that's at the, uh, at the end of the slideshow, you can click on that link. We are adding more this year as we as we create more projects. Uh, there's Explore Scratch itself. If you go to the Scratch interface, right here, the question mark, and here's all the projects here. Great way to start. They're all video based. They say you put the code here. This is how you make your character dance. This is how you make the character talk. Uh, so it's a fantastic way to start the kids off. Is just start off with some tutorials along the way. Uh, and then, after you've done the tutorials, try something on your own. Try and do your own thing after that. And also, books. Uh, this was great if you if you want to know how it ties in more to, like, I don't want to say real coding, but like real coding languages. This book is great. I, that's been helping me to kind of understand how it takes that next step. Uh, and you look at the bottom too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're uh, several of the teachers were doing a little project in coding this year, and this book is great because it's hardcover. The kids can use it as well. Um, they can open it right up. It's got three. It's a uh, spiral bound, so it, it's fairly heavy duty, and the projects are step by step and easy for kids to understand. Uh, the coding games one is good too, but then you have to look at the games and say. How could I fit this into my curriculum? But there's there's a lot of connections. 